So, as we did on that one segment, we're just going to quickly look at each of these kingdom. What are some main characteristics about these? We'll cover these in a lot more detail uh, as in the future chapters, but for right now, so we're going to look at both the RK bacteria and the U bacteria. What do they have in common? Well, they're both prokaryotic. Remember, that was one of the characteristics that we had. And uh, they, the only way that they differ, actually, is in what their cell wall is made out of. Uh, the RK bacteria don't have a certain chemical in their cell wall called peptidoglycan, a long name. Uh, but U bacteria does have that chemical in its cell wall. That's kind of like the distinguishing characteristic. So if we find a bacteria and it has peptidoglycan in the cell wall, then we know it belongs to U bacteria. Uh, they also live in, bacteria can live in a very wide variety of environments, all the way from places that uh, were cold, you know, like below freezing, and they can also live in some of the hot pools that you might find if you went to like Yellowstone National Park, uh, where you have, uh, you know, hot water coming up from below, heated by magma. Uh, in some of them, the reason why they have the colors that they do is because the bacteria is actually causing it to be that color. Have you been there before? To uh, Yellowstone? Yep. A couple times. The next kingdom are what we call protista. Uh, these are going to be some of the ones that cause diseases, just like bacteria often do, but not all bacteria, not all protistas cause disease. Some of them are good ones. Uh, so algae and protozoans belong to this one. Uh, some of them are autotrophic, which means what? I would just say it simply. What does autotrophic mean? Yes? Self-feeding, self right? Auto means self, troph means feed or eat. So they feed themselves, they make their own food. But then there's some of them that are heterotrophic, which means that they, what? They feed on other organisms, right, okay? So some of them are like one or like the other. Um, some of them are mobile, which means they can move around. Uh, they might have some gel or you know, different things that we will learn about, or they have what we call amoeboid motion, uh, where they can move around. Others are stationary. They are stuck in one spot their entire life. Uh, some of them are just one cells in their environment, typically in water. And uh, some of them, will form groups. They don't need each other. Remember, that's what the, the idea of a colony. They don't need each other. So they can, you can break up a colony and then they'll grow, you know, reproduce cells that will fill on the parts that are missing. So uh, these, though, are eukaryotic. Um, the eukaryotic cells that aren't animals, plants, or fungi belong to this one. So in other words, if it's not part of fungi, not part of plants, not part of animals, and it has eukaryotic cells, we put them into this category. So it's kind of a plucked all type of category. Um, next one are the fungi. Okay, so everything else that we're going to talk about have eukaryotic cells. Uh, they're all heterotrophic. Into that we have things like mushrooms, toadstools, whatever you want to call them. Uh, morels uh, that people eat, uh, even this. What does this person suffer from? Athletes have this. I'm giving you a hint. Athlete's foot. Athlete's foot, right? It's a fungus that grows, and uh, you know, I noticed that anytime we go on retreats where we have, uh, or treats or mission trip where we get shower, uh, you know, we often use the same shower and there's a chance that you're gonna get athlete's foot from somebody else. I just know when I come back from that, um, I typically put some medication on my feet to make sure that I've killed any of those that I 
picked up from some other student because I, you know, during in between mission trips, I don't have any problem with it, but I might after I come back. Um, so these are unicellular or they're colonial. Like this would be an example of a colony of cells that make up uh, what we call a mushroom. Another kingdom are the plant kingdoms, so any kind of plants. Remember Aristotle had the little tiny plants, the medium-sized plants, and the big plants that we call trees. Uh, so they all belong here. They all have eukaryotic cells. They're all multicellular. So if, if they make their own food, but they're not multicellular, we won't put them here. We'll put them in the protista category instead. Uh, they have to have tissues to belong to this one. Uh, most are autotrophic. What would be an example of a uh, plant that is not autotrophic or, or can also function in a non-autotrophic way? Yes. Yeah, the Venus flytrap. Now, they the really the real reason behind that is they're getting some nutrients from the insects that they, or you know, the flies or insects, whatever they trap, uh, that they can't get maybe from their environment. So that makes them healthier because they're getting some nutrients they don't get any other way. <clears throat> Then we have the animal kingdom. Again, they're eukaryotic. We said all, all of the kingdoms past protista were going to be uh, eukaryotic. Uh, they're all multicellular, which means they have tissues, right? Now, not only do they have tissues, but then they have organs and systems and stuff like that that we will talk about. Okay, they're all heterotrophic. They all live on other living things, like you said. Um, Okay, so that kind of quickly covers uh, what we already had on our assignment. Now we're going to talk about this naming scheme that we're going to use. In fact, uh, tomorrow's lab is going to be one where you get to kind of put that to practice. How do you name some of these organisms? We're going to give you pictures of organisms, and then we'll give you a key that you're going to use to help you figure out into what categories do I put them? Now, what does binomial nomenclature actually mean? Well, bi means what? What does bi mean? Two, right? And then nomial comes from the word, a root word that means name. So this is a two name. And then notice you see this same part at the beginning. Nomenclature, it's a two name naming system. In other words, every living thing has two names. And the two names that it has are the genus and the species. So, humans, we said, what was our two name that we have? What's the name? Yes. Yeah, we're Homo sapien. Homo sapien. The Homo is the genus to which we belong. Sapien is the species underneath that genus. Uh, here's, another, here's an animal that has two names. Canis familiarius. Canis. What do you think that sounds like? Dogs, right. Sounds like dogs. And then what do you think this might mean? <coughs> yeah, domestic dogs. The, the ones that we, we obtain, you have as pets. Uh, not a wild dog, you know. But, I mean, yes, some of these dogs can be, you know, run loose and, and behave wild, but they actually came from pets. Somebody's pet, you know, that was not cared for and has had to care for itself. Uh, so yeah, that would be the dog. Now, notice that the first, the genus is always capitalized. Genus is always capitalized. And then the species name is never capitalized. Okay, So capitalize genus, don't capitalize species. 
So when you write Homo sapien, the H in Homo is going to be capitalized. Sapien is, is going to be lowercase. Uh, now, what if I am typing this up in a paper? You know, like typing up my assignment. If I give the, spe uh, the scientific name for an animal, I will italicize it. Yes, it's still capitalized for the first word, lowercase for the second, but I'll select it and hit italicize. If you're writing it longhand, you know, with your hand, you know, using a pen or pencil, then you're going to underline it. Okay? So that's the way we distinguish, that's kind of the rules that as scientists have agreed that that's the way we handle a scientific name of an organism. So if you type it, it's going to be this way. If you write it out by hand, it's going to be that way. You underline it. So we know you're talking about the name of a, a living organism. Now, the um, all the words that we use in um, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, uh, and the name and the names of all the little subcategories and stuff that we have, all, all come from Latin. Well, why do we use Latin? Well, because Latin is a dead language. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by Latin is a dead language? Yes. It's not used anymore. It's not used anymore. No one speaks it. Okay. No one speaks it. So the beauty of that is then if I learn Latin when I'm young, it'll be the same, me have the same meanings when I'm old. Okay? It won't change. It won't change from one generation to the next. It all has the same meaning, and the beauty of Latin, it turns out, is that the words actually are very descriptive. So because of their descriptive nature, you can often figure out what it's talking about. Uh, for instance, uh, here I'm thinking of an organism, and uh, I spelled it wrong already. It's made up of two parts. Uh, what's the last part mean? Pod, or sometimes a variation of it is ped, which means what? Yeah, you're giving, yeah, that's what it is, yeah. But the last part, ped, would be foot, or you know, like you put your foot on pedals, right? Okay? Or if you go to a podiatrist, a podiatrist there's help you with your feet, you know, whatever you, if you have problems with your feet. Okay, so this has to do with foot on the end. And then cephalo. has to do with head, okay? And we, somebody maybe caught what she said over there. Uh, what organism looks like a head with legs or feet attached directly to the head? The tadpole. Well, I, I can see why you would say that. But an octopus, okay? So the, notice the name is so descriptive that you can figure out that they're talking about octopus. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to the word species, you know we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, a species is going to be a, a have a population of organisms. Uh, they are going to be structurally similar, but they will have some variation. Okay. So all of you in here are the same species, right? But there's variation. There's enough variation, except for two people in here, that I can, I know who I'm looking at because you're enough different than everybody else that I can distinguish you, okay? So we're, we're still struggling on these two right here because they're identical twins, but um, maybe some of you aren't. Those are, usually those are, that are your friends. Do they get, get you mixed up yet? Still sometimes, yeah. So, so even your friends have trouble with it, so I don't have to feel so bad. Um, now, another thing that we have put as a characteristic or requirement for, it to, for animals to be in the same species 
is they need to be able to interbreed and in the process produce offspring that are fertile. In other words, which means they in turn can breed and produce more offspring. Now, what was an example of a cross that we've talked about where the offspring isn't fertile most of the time? Start out with a horse and a horse and a donkey, and you end up with a mule. Okay? But the mules are not fertile. So, do we put them in the same species or not? Okay? That is kind of an artificial division that we as man have, uh, humans have created, you know, for our particular naming scheme that we have. Um, now, are there problems with this concept of the species? Yes, these characteristics are artificial. We just artificially decided that if the organism is able to breed but not produce fertile offspring, then um, it's going to be considered not in the same species. Now, some of these uh, problems could, the fact that they can't, maybe can't even breed at all, it might be uh, kind of because of their environment. But some of those could uh, actually be ignoring some similarities they re that really are there, you know. Um, so this concept of interbreeding is kind of an issue uh, when you're deciding, will, the, will these two animals be in the same species or not, okay? So the inability to interbreed does happen in some species, okay? Is, is it possible for a St. Bernard and a, let's say a male St. Bernard uh, and a female Dachshund to have puppies? Is that gonna, is it gonna work? Now, there's too much difference in size for that to be possible. Now, could we artificially produce this? You know, take sperm from the male and the egg from the female and cross it? Probably. Now, there are some problems even within that. Let's say that it, it does happen naturally. The, if the puppies are going to be what, probably what size? Probably when they're born, they're almost going to be the size of a... Of a Dachshund, right? Well, that's going that could probably harm or kill the mother, right? In that combination. So there, you know, even though there's an inability, if it does happen, it it could end up killing the mother. Well, that's not good. Um, now this, uh, let's just go back to this again. Um, now, sometimes there can be other things that cause them not to mate with each other. Uh, when I um, was working uh, on my uh, degree in college, I needed a couple more hours, and I took this independent study where you, you pick some topic to research, and then you write this paper uh, to do that. Uh, the, my paper ended up being like 50 pages long. So, but yeah, there was a, a lot of information to be included, so it wasn't that hard to write it. It was just a lot of stuff to find out. And um, so I asked my, I mean, one of the, my favorite classes that I took at that time, or, and also one of the more recent ones, was uh, I took a class in ornithology with a study of birds. So I asked my ornithology professor for an idea. And he said, well, one of the problems that he'd been trying to mull through and figure out is does a lesser prairie chicken and a sharp-tailed grouse do they really should they really be counted the same species okay and so that was my job you know to figure that out find out all the information I possibly could uh, as far as how they look they look pretty similar 
Their feathers may be a little longer, color slightly different. One thing they did have different is when the males would go through their courtship ritual and they would puff up their neck. There would be uh, bare spots on their neck that didn't have any feathers. And in one, the cheek patches, they called them, are orange. And in the other one, they're kind of like a pinkish purple. So in other words, they clearly can tell they're different uh, as far as looks are concerned. Another thing they have different is how the males do their courtship ritual. Uh, one of them, I think it's the sharp-tailed grouse, if I remember right. Um, the uh, male, when he's courting a female, will quickly stamp his feet on the ground really fast. and It makes a drumming sound, especially if they would maybe hop up on top of a hollow log. I mean, you could hear it from a, a, quite a ways away as they're just stomping around on there. Well, that attracts uh, sharp-tailed grouse females, okay? But not necessarily a lesser prairie chicken. And the uh, lesser prairie chicken male uh, would have a courtship ritual that didn't attract the sharp-tailed grouse females, you know? So there's somewhat of a difference between those two. So they thought them as being two separate species. But the question you have to ask is, are there any places that they actually live in the same area, you know, where they actually see each other? If they don't see each other, obviously they're not going to be able to mate, right? So, and so you have to study the area where they do cross, and do you see any young ones being produced that have characteristics of both, which means there must have been a sharp-tailed grouse and a lesser prairie chicken mating with each other, and they did find those. There are some, not a lot, but there are some, which means they do interbreed. Then you have to check the next step. Are they fertile? Can they then attract mates and produce more young? And so the conclusion of, of my paper was they really belong to in the same species. That was my conclusion. Now, I don't know whatever became of that paper. I've, I've, I've never had ever bothered to check to see, you know, did my professor take that along with his information and actually um, help other ornithologists to put them in the same species? I don't know. So now let's look at this. We already have talked about it a little bit. In Genesis, it talks about kind. It doesn't use the word species. So what is a biblical kind? Well, according to Genesis, it's a natural grouping of organisms that do have the ability to interbreed. Where did I get that? Well, from the verses that talk about kind, it does sound like they need to be able to produce more young. Uh, so here's, Gen we'll go through a bunch of verses here. I'll just read them to you. Uh, Genesis 1.20 says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. Okay, firmament of the heaven is like the sky. Uh, and God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Okay, so in other words, talking about living things produce after their own kind. Horses produce more horses, not alligators. Okay, and every winged fowl after his kind. So you expect the young from the birds to look eventually like the adults. Uh, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters in the sea, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So this was all happening on day five of creation. Let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind. It keeps that phrase, keeps popping up, doesn't it? After its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after uh, his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that was very good. So the idea of kind, in other words, they reproduce the same thing that they are. Same thing that they are. Now, 
The only problem is, is what are we going to do with some animals that we have as different species that could possibly be in the same kind? Now, the, pro the word that they bring up is something called uh, brahminology, uh, and it's the study of classification that's based on the Bible's idea of a biblical kind. And here are some animals that uh, could possibly be in the same kind, like a dog, a wolf, and a coyote could possibly be the same kind. How do we? So how would we go about checking to see if they were in the same kind? Well, what they have to be able to interbreed and produce offspring. Uh, are there, is there evidence, or have you ever heard of these hybrid mixes of wolves? It's a wolf crossed with uh, maybe like a German Shepherd or a Husky or something like that, which means a wolf and a, and a dog are, can interbreed. One is domesticated, in other words, we care for it, and one lives in the wild, can care for itself but they are capable of interbreeding. Um, some of the cat in the cat family, uh, just like we have a horse and a donkey and we end up with a mule, we have crossed some tigers and lions and we end up with something called a liger. Okay, has some characteristics of both. Maybe they're in the same kind. So when God is instructing Noah to bring animals after their kind into the ark, it maybe doesn't have to be one of every species. Because some of these species can be just different variations of the same kind. Uh, you know, we talked about horses and donkeys. I've seen some uh, zebras. I think they were crossed with a horse. And so here's a horse with stripes. So maybe they're in the same kind. So speciation. This is a formation of new species by man's definition of a species. Uh, does speciation occur? Our, our, our daily bobblehead. I just need to shoot you for good measure, right? Uh, now, what if these animals, if some environmental condition caused them to move into different areas where they no longer, one group never really sees the other group, okay? Uh, and so you could end up, you know, with enough of a difference between them that we would call them different species, but they really are the same kind, maybe like all the different kinds of rabbits that we see are really all, you know, can you mate a cottontail rabbit with a um, snowshoe hare, let's say, which lives up in the northern states where they have snow. They have big back feet so they can hop across the snow without sinking into the snow. Um, so, th you know, this would be, you know, uh, we would consider them different species, but because they live in different areas, they don't have a chance to mate with each other. 